In the beginning of the story, we see Cynthia as being described by her sister. She was just like the main character on a stage. When the sun shines on her golden, wavy hair, as soon as she blinks her bright green eyes, she looks like a goddess coming right from above. Being mesmerized by her charm and beauty, everybody adores her and wishes her a great start to the day. No doubt, Cynthia was the world's favorite, but even more than that, she means the world to her goth vibe sister, Stella. Stella and Cynthia live together in a great castle. Cynthia exclaims joyfully as soon as Stella meets her, and says she has been waiting for her. Stella is too happy to see her sister this morning, and thanks her for waiting. The story moves forward, and we see Cynthia trying to defend Stella's shortcomings from their father and the world but it appears to be just a farce. In reality, she was something else. Stella understands this only after she is falsely accused by her sister. She assumed that maybe Cynthia accused her for her crimes because she was afraid of being caught, but the fact was that Cynthia hated her enough to kill her. And the hard part of reality is that nobody would be saving Stella because everyone hates her, including their father. Till now, she has blindly followed her sister who was digging a grave for her. Happy enough that her plan succeeded, Cynthia moves forward to kill her, but to her surprise, Stella opens up a little bottle of poison, and before Cynthia could do anything, she gulps the poison and dies. The plan of her sister, who wanted to gift her a miserable death fails, and the chapter of Stella's life ends. Stella hears that someone is waking her up. She opens up her eyes and realizes that it was not the end and somehow, she is back in time again. She finds herself in that wizard orphanage where she has spent her childhood. This place was called Kendall Orphanage, a place as poor as any other orphanage, with the difference that it only has those children who will become future wizards. The whole empire was struggling with a demon, and to overcome its power, a great number of wizards were required. Noble families used to take orphans as wards if they were able to use magic. Cynthia and Stella were not real sisters either. They were the wards of the Nacked family, one of the three guardians of the territory and nobles among nobles. Stella remembers what happened at that time. Maybe she wasn't that qualified to be adopted by that family. She hasn't done anything special. The voices of people keep ringing inside her head. She hasn't been acclaimed as much as her sister Cynthia, who was called not only talented but also kind-hearted and lovable. In the past, Stella fell in front of Grand Duke Nacht when he entered the orphanage to choose a ward for adoption. He noticed her and said he would sponsor her. She considered herself lucky enough then, stupidly, only to regret the after-effects. But this time, she is not going to repeat the same mistake again. All the children are lined up, and the Grand Duke Roderick Nacht is ready to select the child he is going to sponsor. He enters the room and marches down towards the neatly formed file of orphans, with Stella is standing among them. Roderick starts looking for a suitable candidate, and Stella tells herself to not fall this time. She assures herself that it is going to be alright. She was waiting for it to be over soon, but Grand Duke stealthily marches up towards her, and then he stops. Stella looks upwards, greatly surprised, just like everyone else present in the room. The Grand Duke was sitting on his knees in front of Stella. He asks her if she will be coming with him to Nacht. Tearful and amused, Stella is confused as to why he is still in front of her, and the Duke is patiently looking at her for her answer. Around Grand Duke Roderick, there was a certain kind of chilling aura, as if he had returned from the mist. Stella could clearly sense the powerful magic coming from him when he came near. The world is struggling with evil demons, and archmages are always ready for that battle in the Empire. Therefore, talented mages are always guarded, even if they are just normal people. Through sponsors who are also their guardians, they can enter the nobility as the guarded. The marriage between the guardian's children and the guards is very popular, because these marriages can create even more powerful archmage bloodlines. There are three great noble families. The Euros clan protects the sky, the Parado clan protects the blue sea, and the Nacht protects the land. The leader of the army of archmages is the Grand Duke Orhan who was also the guardian of Stella and Cynthia. Stella wonders why such a powerful person is in front of her like this. The Grand Duke asks Stella for her name, but and she doesn't want to tell her that. He asks her the same question again, and she finally gives him her name. As he gently calls her name, Stella wonders if he is going to call her by her with such an endearing voice. She feels that something has definitely changed this time. And most importantly, why is he even asking her to come to Nacht, that graveyard where she had met such a dreadful end? Stella doesn't want to return, but suddenly her head starts hurting. She faints for a while, leaving everyone in utter shock. The last thing she sees is the worried expression of Grand Duke, and wonders why is he so concerned about her because he has always hated her. The next thing that happens after this in Stella's memories is her first meeting with Cynthia. In her previous life, Cynthia insisted on Stella calling her sister rather than being formal with her. 
They became close and Cynthia never left her alone. She has always loved her, brought her sweets and gifts, and even took her to meet her biological parents at her mansion in summer. Cynthia took care of her dearly and gave her dolls to play with. Nobody had ever loved Stella before like that. Both Cynthia and her parents were treating her as their own family, even though she was a commoner, and she was touched. Then one night, Cynthia came to Stella's room. She wanted to do something with her before they went to sleep. In her hands was an old, disturbing book, and Stella didn't want to open it. But it seemed that Cynthia was looking forward to this. It was written there about how to share the magical powers with another person. And Cynthia explains that she wanted to share her powers with Stella as she doesn't seem to have any. Stella was shocked and wondered why the Grand Duke even chose her then. She denied Cynthia's offer as this was clearly cheating. However, Cynthia used emotional blackmailing as her weapon. She told Stella that if she is proven to be useless, she will be sent back to the orphanage. Cynthia claimed that since she was her only sister, she doesn't want to lose her. The naive Stella was compelled to believe this, as nobody has ever loved before her like Stella. She wanted to stay with her, so she did what Cynthia asked her to, and promised to keep it as their secret. Magic appeared around them, but trusting and having expectations for someone sometimes resulted in deceiving and Stella realized it too late in her life. This time, she is determined that she won't be repeating the same mistakes ever again. Stella wakes up with that and hears some noise outside. She finds that the Grand Duke has ordered the director of the orphanage to receive punishment for failing to carry out the mission. Ten minutes ago, Stella was still lying unconscious in the arms of her teacher. On the other hand, Orhan was still thinking about the reasons why she fainted. Maybe she did so because he she didn't want him to touch her. Or maybe it was just a mistake, as she was too stressed to accept his offer. Suddenly, her fickle health grabs his attention. Stella was too thin, though she was in an orphanage that has been generously funded by Orhan. Yet she, along with other children, is clearly malnourished. The Duke knew that the orphanage is not underfunded, and the reason why the children are malnourished was obvious. Marnin Kendall, the director of this orphanage, is behind all this corruption. Between all this, Stella was slowly coming back to her senses. She heard Grand Duke yelling at Kendall that all the children of the orphanage are important military resources for that empire. Under no circumstances can they get hurt or be exploited by anyone. Clearly, Marnin Kendall was not qualified to carry out this operation and was liable for punishment. Orhan ordered the soldiers to take Kendall out of this place until further orders, and the man kept struggling and yelling but was advised to be silent. Stella's eyes meet with those of the Grand Duke after that. She wonders why he has that cold expression. Maybe it was because he might not be pleased that she passed out. Or maybe he doesn't want to adopt her now because he thinks she is weak. Stella sees this as an opportunity to get rid of this situation. She starts crying into the arms of her teacher, Miss Lisa, who was hugging her tightly. She decides to act as a vulnerable person who is soft and fragile so that she will be considered unfit for adoption. Making sure that she had the attention of the Grand Duke along with other officials, Stella started crying and wailing, insisting that her teacher not let her go. She promises to be a good kid, take care of others, and always listen to Miss Lisa. Her teacher is worried about this weird behavior, and tries to explain to the Duke that maybe Stella is too scared of leaving this place because it is her home. She tells Orhan that she will try to advise her to get adopted later. On hearing her statement, Stella again starts to wail and clutches Miss Lisa even more strongly. She tells her she doesn't want to go. Though she was trying to fake her crying initially, the real waterworks burst out so easily. Miss Lisa also gets emotional, and the attendant of the Duke tries to console her. He asks her to be strong, or else the child will become more vulnerable. He then goes to Orhan and tells him to act as if he doesn't want to take Stella away. Only then will she be fine. Stella is looking at him with hope, and when the Duke agrees to it, she can be seen smiling. She thinks that she can now stop crying. But as soon as she notices Orhan staring at her, she starts crying again. Orhan finally accepts he is defeated and decides to go back. Back in her room, Stella is still sitting in the arms of her loving teacher. Even though she created such a scene there, Miss Lisa was still affectionate towards her. She tells her that Orhan has already left, so she is safe now. No one would be taking her to the Naks for adoption. Miss Lisa comforts her further, saying that since she has such a pretty face, she shouldn't be crying. Stella feels comfortable and loved in her arms, and suddenly starts remembering her time with Cynthia and how different that false love was from this true affection and genuine warmth. The things that Cynthia showed her with her smile and sweet words were just cleverly schemed to manipulate her. Apart from the fact that Cynthia hated her, there was another truth Stella had discovered on the day of her death. 
she confronted Cynthia about that fateful day in the past where they shared their magic power in secret. Stella wanted to know if she was the one who really received Cynthia's powers that night, or was it the reverse? Cynthia laughed at Stella's stupidity and told her that it took her a long time to deduce that she was the one who got her magic power stolen that day. Stella was lost in her thoughts when Miss Lisa pulled her out of it. She asks her what is running through her mind and if she is still scared. Stella thanks her teacher for helping her today. She wonders if she had been with Miss Lisa in her previous life, would her life have been different? Miss Lisa is engrossed in her own thoughts. Looking at Stella, she finds her pale and admits that she would have to let Stella go with the Grand Duke eventually. But things turned out to be in such an absurd manner that she has no other choice but to take care of her for now. Suddenly, the door opens with a thud, and Kendall reappears, searching for Stella. His nostrils are flaring, and he is gritting his teeth in anger. He demands to see the culprit responsible for his punishment. On noticing her, he then grabs Stella's hair and snatches her out of her teacher's lap. The headmaster pulls her out by grabbing her hair mercilessly. Miss Lisa pleads with him not to do that, but he simply pushes her out of his way and starts taking Stella with him. He yells at her for being the reason he lost his own property, and as retaliation, he has decided to sell her into slavery. The headmaster was busy threatening Stella until a voice startled him from behind, and told him to get his hands off the girl. As soon as Kendall looks behind him, he is welcomed with a swift punch straight to his face. The very next moment, he is lying on the floor, fainted and bleeding through his nose. Stella looks up to find Argo, the eldest son of Grand Duke Nacht, standing there. She knows that he is not the kind of person who gets mad that often. Stella is still wondering about that when she finds the Grand Duke reaching there too. With Orr in here, everything was solved like magic, and the headmaster was dragged away from the spot. Stella wonders why her life is taking so many turns. She was almost killed by the headmaster long before she could be betrayed by Cynthia. Also, she wonders why everybody cares about her now. Miss Lisa rushes towards Stella to make sure she is okay and hugs her. Orhan now realizes that it would be tough for Stella if she stayed back in the orphanage. He asks her again whether she would like to come with them or not. Looking into his eyes, Stella wonders if there are many things she has not realized before. Is she more talented than she thinks she is? Maybe Orhan saw potential in her and chose to become her guardian and take her with him. Was it the reason he was so disappointed when she failed to meet his expectations? In her previous life, since the start, everybody has always made comparisons between Cynthia and Stella. Nobody has ever shown faith in her. For everybody, Stella was just a normal orphan, unlike her sister, who was a genius. But the Grand Duke had been indifferent to all this gossip. Back then, Stella thought that she stole Cynthia's powers and lived with guilt throughout her life for deceiving Orhan. She was living in the mercy that he had never kicked her out. She tried everything she could to make her remorse go away, and Cynthia had always taken advantage of it all. From ordering Stella to write all her letters in her handwriting, to making Stella work for her like a maid, she had done everything to belittle her in the mask of sisterhood. Yet the Grand Duke and his son never acknowledged her efforts. She was told that it was all good for nothing. Finally, the day came when she was framed by Cynthia, and the Grand Duke locked her up. Stella decides that she will now change her future step by step. If things get out of hand this time, it would be difficult to handle them, and that is why she cannot make big changes so suddenly. If she stays back in the orphanage, a new headmaster would certainly get appointed, and who knows how he will turn out to be. Maybe he would be crueler than Kendall, indulged in human trafficking and more unkind things no one could ever imagine. On the other hand, if she goes to the Nacht family, she will meet Cynthia almost half a year from now. But this time, she won't be able to deceive her again. Stella thinks that if she doesn't love her, Cynthia will never trick her like before. She decides to go with the Grand Duke first. Once she turns 15, she will be able to join the military academy. Until then, she can endure the hardships she faces in the Nacht family. This Lisa asks her what she thinks about the Grand Duke's proposal. She claims that even though she could not protect her from what happened, Orhan will certainly protect her from everything, and that's why she should accept his proposal. In their conversation, Argo asks Miss Lisa if she would prefer becoming the new president of this orphanage. Both Stella and Miss Lisa are surprised at his offer. Stella thinks that if Miss Lisa were to become the new president of this orphanage, then it would be fine if she stayed back at this place. However, she knows that it will only happen if she becomes Nack's child. Miss Lisa asks her what she wants and starts carrying her to the carriage along with the Grand Duke's group. Orhan's manager senses that little Stella is frustrated and maybe a bit confused, so he advises the Grand Duke to take Stella directly with him to the mansion affectionately. He advises him to take Stella gently into his arms so that she starts to feel comfortable with him. The Grand Duke agrees to it and turns back. 
He asks Miss Lisa if he can take the girl with him. She tries to hand Stella over to the Grand Duke, but she tightly hugs her instead. Miss Lisa apologizes to the Duke, saying that Stella has never been like this before. She then gently puts Stella into the carriage, handing over the bag to her. She bids her farewell, and promises that she will visit her often. She asks her to make a promise in exchange, and says that she should become a nice child, and everybody, including Grand Duke, will love her. Stella too bids her farewell, and with the exchange of good wishes, the carriage moves ahead towards the Grand Duke's palace. Stella is sitting with Orhan and Argo. She is wondering if she should thank them for saving her, but decides against it. Also, now she doesn't have to try harder, because her guilt is gone. She is too tired, and as soon as they reach the mansion, she falls asleep. Everyone assembles at the gate of the mansion to receive the guest and Orhan, but he hushes everyone in silence so that Stella, who is sound asleep in his arms, does not wake up. Argo asks whether he could carry her, but Orhan assures him everything is fine, so he doesn't need to worry. He asks where the room is, and Argo tells him that the butler has already prepared it for her. Doubtful of his eagerness, the Grand Duke asks his son, is he not busy today? Argo hesitates a little and then says that he can do this much and it will not affect anything. Argo is still wondering why he is so much affected by Stella's presence, and he has no idea why he couldn't leave her side. Suddenly, Orhan's younger son, Maximus, comes running to greet him. The Grand Duke alerts him to not make a loud sound or the girl will wake up. On hearing this, Maximus pouts angrily. Why are all the men in this family carbon copies of each other? He asks Argo how much older she is and if she is going to stay with them. Argo replies that Stella is one year older than him, and from now on she is going to stay at their house. Meanwhile, the Grand Duke gently lays Stella on her bed. He orders the boys standing at the door to leave her alone, as she needs to rest. Argo notices a bit more of a change in the behavior of his father and brother than usual. He himself is feeling the same. The moment he saw Stella being held cruelly by the headmaster, he couldn't control his anger and still can't even think about it, as it makes him angry. Leaving the door open, Argo looks back at Stella for one more time and says that this time things will be different. Wait, what? Does he know something about Stella returning from the future? Stella is asleep but wakes up to find herself somewhere in utter darkness with somebody calling her name. She looks around and finds Cynthia calling her. Stella is surprised to see her, but Cynthia grabs her hand tightly and tells her again in a dramatic manner that she hates her. Stella struggles to free her hand from her tight grip, and Cynthia again asks her goofily, is she happy now to take her position? She asks her to answer it, and Stella wakes up in a cold sweat. She realizes that it was just a dream, more like a haunting nightmare. Stella finds herself lying in the cradle of the moon, a special room that belonged to Cynthia in her previous life. Her room in that life was simple, with all the essentials she would need but nothing special. It was more than enough she could ever want, as she never had her own room back in the orphanage. Cynthia was with her when the maid took her to the room, and she then insisted that they should now go see her room, which she had been eyeing for a long time. She wished for the moon cradle, one of the three best rooms in that whole mansion, after the rooms of the Grand Duke and Argo. It even had a separate room attached for the maids. Everything was so grand in this room. The beautiful bed had big windows from which the beams of sun were coming in and dancing throughout the room. It had the most beautiful curtains, mats, furniture, and countless other things of great comfort one could ever imagine. According to Cynthia, it suited her perfectly. She invited Stella to come play with her here sometimes, and told her that she could even sleep in the maid's room. The Duke didn't refuse Cynthia's moon cradle request, and eventually it became her room. Sitting in the same bed now in this life, Stella thinks that there is no reason that she deserves this room. She realizes that she must have come here while walking in sleep, because she used to sleep in the maid's room in her previous life. Suddenly, Cynthia's words start ringing in her mind, asking Stella if she really wanted to take her position. Stella decides that she wouldn't fight for a position with her sister even in the future. She would get misunderstood again if she stayed here, and therefore she would endure it until she got admitted to the military academy, and her job here would be done. Thinking about it, Stella leaves the moon cradle and slowly starts walking in the lobby. Suddenly, her feet stumble, and she falls to the ground, getting herself hurt in the knees. Slowly, she gets up and starts searching for the shabby room that once belonged to her. She finds that it is quite dirty and unkempt, but at least her bed is there with a dust cover, and then she dozes off to a good, comfortable sleep. It was a very beautiful morning the next day. Daisy, the head maid of Grand Duke Nacht, was ready to serve a new Lady Orhan had brought in yesterday. She was hoping to serve the future Grand Duchess, or in other words, the girl who will one day marry Argo. However, when the butler told her that it was someone from the orphanage possessing the special qualities enough to acquire the moon cradle, Daisy was shocked. 
she thinks that if Orhan has given the moon cradle to an orphan commoner, she must be someone really special. Therefore, she should be carefully served. Daisy, with another maid, goes to meet the girl. Knocking on the door, they try to wake up Stella but hear no response. Daisy then opens the door, only to find it empty. She searches for Stella everywhere, from the reception room to the reading area, but she is nowhere to be seen. Since they can't find the girl, they need to tell Orhan about it, and thinking about it, Daisy panics. They have to find her at any cost before the Grand Duke finds out that she is missing, because apparently he cares a lot for her. The maids ask whether she is going to hide this truth from the duke, and Daisy has nothing to say to them. She is already irritated enough and tells the maid that since Orhan cares a lot for the girl, keeping the fact that she is missing will be a surefire method to get kicked out of the palace. Daisy tells the Grand Duke about the disappearance of Stella. Orhan is worried and angry at such negligence for the child, and Daisy apologizes to him, saying that she has no excuse. She assures him that her servants are searching for Stella everywhere, and soon she will be found. However, to her utter surprise, the Grand Duke gets up from his chair and announces that he will come to find her. Everybody among the palace staff is surprised to see Grand Duke himself coming to search for the kid. Murmuring starts among the servants about the eagerness of the Grand Duke coming to search for the orphan himself. Some of the maids think that maybe that orphan could be a lost daughter from a royal bloodline. The butler orders them all to stop gossiping for now and keep their questions for later. Right now, it is urgent that Stella gets found. Orhan knows that he cannot find her even with the number of servants he is facing right now. He knows that there are many dangerous ancient spells asleep in the palace, and he can't let a child walk alone here. Gritting his teeth and clenching his fist, he thinks again about where Stella could possibly be. He starts having strange intuitions about her, and following the gut feeling he had got from her before, he starts walking in a certain direction. Daisy tries to ask him where is he going, but the butler advises her to keep quiet. Orhan thinks that he feels the same, just like he did on the day when he went to that orphanage. Walking among the kids, he felt strange, and even though he couldn't see Stella's face, he had that definite sense that she was the one he had been looking for. Just like that time, now too, he feels that she is in the room right in front of him. He opens the door and finds that it is quite messy, as if nobody had used it for a long time. The Grand Duke is shocked because Stella must have been in this cold and dusty room as is evident from one slept in bed. Lifting up the blanket kept in the bed, he examines it and suddenly notices the blood stain on that blanket. It makes him a bit more frustrated and angry because Stella is certainly hurt. He then orders the butler to call everyone here and search around for the child as much as they can in this area. The Duke leaves the room, but then suddenly, Daisy notices something behind her back. The door of that cupboard opens with a creak and inside it was Stella. Before the head maid can panic, Stella asks her to be silent, as she deliberately erased all the traces of her before climbing to the cupboard. Daisy could not understand what she was doing there, so Stella tells her the truth. The moment she got up, she realized that the room she was in was not ready to be provided to anyone. If it was meant to be given to her, it should have been tidied and neatly cleaned, but it was all dusty, which means she has underestimated the possibility of her getting the moon cradle. The moon cradle was the room that was really assigned to her by the Grand Duke. She had made a chaotic mistake last night, and if Orhan found out that she was sleeping in this room, he would not like her, as this was an act of insult against him. She wanted to get away from the room as soon as possible, but then she heard the voice of servants and Orhan outside. Therefore, she disappeared from the bed and quietly climbed into the cupboard before anyone entered. Stella hid there quietly, because she has been used to staying silent all her life. She knew she would have to come out eventually, but it would be a terrible thing for the staff if the Grand Duke found her himself. Now Stella insists that Daisy silently take her out and announce that she found her. Daisy also finds this a good option, or else Grand Duke would get very angry. She is touched that the little girl did that for her, but Stella acts aloof even though she did this so that she would be on good terms with the head maid. Daisy obeys her request, carries her out of the place, and announces she has found her. The Grand Duke learns that she was in the closet, and wonders how he could not know when he got in the room. But it is not important for him right now, as Stella is hurt and needs to be treated right away. He demands that Daisy hand over the child to him. The head maid is ready to hand Stella to the Grand Duke, but upon seeing him in front of her again, Stella quickly hugs Daisy tightly and turns her face away from him. This action leaves him speechless, but Daisy asks him not to worry, as she will safely carry the child to the doctor. The doctor arrives and examines her wound carefully. After putting the bandage in it, he praises Stella for dealing with the wound so bravely, and even offers her candy to make her feel comfortable. 
Stella can't believe that she is being treated differently than she used to be treated before. In her past life, even the maid would be reluctant to offer her the medicine, and only when Cynthia pointed it out did she get any medical attention. Stella now thinks that perhaps she didn't go back in time but had entered a parallel universe. Suddenly, the Grand Duke asks her why she went to sleep in such a small room. Stella tells him that when she woke up and looked around, it was hard to believe that such a good room could be hers, so she went away from there. Her answer leaves everyone speechless and pitying her. Stella notices the gaze of the Grand Duke. It was the same look as he had back in the orphanage, full of care yet a bit irritated by her misery. It was an expression of patience, with a slight annoyance. Stella knows that he had a reason for giving her such a nice room, but she doesn't want to question him about it. Neither does she want to get involved with anybody in this mansion. It is like a fantasy that will change as soon as Cynthia arrives anyway. She believes that there is no point of comparison between her and Cynthia. The talent gap between them might not be huge this time, but the difference in their personality and upbringing would be too much to bear. Stella thinks that if she keeps asking useless questions, she might get some answers that will give her useless hopes. So she simply apologizes to the Grand Duke for the fuss she caused and assures him it will never happen again. In response, Orhan tells her that she is not guilty of the miseries, therefore, she should not be feeling apologetic about them. The Moon Cradle Room really belongs to her and she should get acquainted with it. Stella knows that she will have to give that room to Cynthia once she arrives. She wonders if she should refuse it now, but decides against it. After all, she was going to another room naturally once her two-faced elder sister came. Stella thinks that if she gives the Moon Cradle Room to Cynthia naturally, she would think of her as a harmless girl and will have no intention of confronting her. Stella thinks that this is a great idea. She can stay in the room, and because she was so familiar with the maid's room here in her last life, she will just sleep there. The Duke notices that Stella is lost somewhere in her own thoughts, and he asks her if she has something to say. Stella nods her head to tell him that she has nothing to say. Orhan realizes that Stella has been acting maturely since coming to the mansion. Back in the orphanage, she was just like a small child, so fragile and feeble, but now, she is different. It is going to take some time for her to adapt to this family as her own. Suddenly, Daisy tells him that Stella hasn't had her breakfast till now and she will bring her meal to her room. Daisy is also surprised at the odd behavior of Stella, a girl who wakes up at night and gets surprised after seeing a nice room. On top of that, the girl sighs as if she had something to worry about. The headmaid thinks that maybe Stella will soon forget her past and enjoy being a child of Nacht. After thinking about all this, Daisy enters the room to find it empty again. She wonders if Stella went to the shabby room on the third floor again. But then the maid room's door opens, and she comes out of that. Daisy tells her that this room is only for the maids and not her. Stella replies that she didn't know this and felt better when she went in there. Daisy then tells her that she should have her breakfast now. Stella decided not to act so stubbornly, or else they would move her away from this place. She looks at her meal. Though it looked so delicious, she was feeling sleepy. Daisy asks her if she didn't sleep well last night, and Stella tells her that she couldn't. The maid tells her to eat as much as she can before going to sleep, so Stella picks up her knife and fork and starts eating. Daisy is amazed to see that even though Stella was raised in an orphanage, she has such excellent table manners and eating etiquette. Stella starts feeling dizzy and sleepy, and wonders if she was supposed to be this sleepy. She then realizes that this is happening since she is a child now, and children are supposed to sleep a lot. Daisy assumes that Stella doesn't want to eat further and orders the maid to take care of her leftovers. She hands Stella a glass of water and then puts her to bed to sleep. She orders the maid to keep an eye on her or she will disappear again. Stella starts having those nightmares again, and she wakes up in despair. To avoid them, she decides to sleep in the maid's room attached to it. The maid was sleeping while keeping a watch on her, so she quietly sneaks into another room. Though she was comfortable at this place, it gives her bad memories of her past. She was a gloomy orphan, and people used to talk about how she wrote letters for Cynthia, sewed handkerchiefs, and worked like a maid. People assumed she will be the future maid of Cynthia when she becomes the future duchess. Cynthia used to treat her like one too. Stella has done all the odd jobs for her, which she was never interested in. She only did them for the happiness of her sister. It didn't matter what others said, because Stella believed Cynthia considers her as her sister and accepts all of her efforts. The poor Stella thought that Cynthia had shared her powers with her and saved her from getting kicked out of the palace. She was really grateful for it, but felt weird sometimes. Sometimes Stella wanted to leave her sister and run far away from her, no matter how hard the new path may be. 
Back then, she was too naive to trust her instincts completely. Now, she wonders what Cynthia will think now when she returns to see her occupying the cradle of the moon. With thoughts like these, Stella dozes off again. Later that day, Daisy finds Stella in the maid's room again. She demands to know what she was doing there. She tells Stella that it was alright that she was comfortable in the maid's room, but she should get acquainted with the cradle of the moon, as it belonged to her only. Stella wondered why Daisy is being so strict and fussy about her actions. The Grand Duke is away subjugating the monsters near the capital. Argo has also returned to the academy, and Maximus doesn't bother much about her, just like he did before. Even though Stella thought she would be living comfortably here, she wonders why it is getting weirder day by day. She realizes that Daisy is more faithful to the orders of the Grand Duke than she had thought. Daisy asks her to sit in her own room and not here in the maid's room. Stella thinks that it will only last for half a year, and after that, it will be over when Cynthia comes here. On seeing her sitting quietly, Daisy asks Stella if she is going to just sit quietly like this or if she plans to do something. Stella says that she is reading a book, but the maid once again starts talking about her going to the maid's room again. She claims that even though she is comfortable there, it is like an insult to the duke. Stella gets angry and pouts, as she too has lived half of her life in that shabby room, and that means that Daisy's statement is basically insulting her. She tells the maid again that it is not like that. Daisy decides that the reason for Stella's gloominess is all because she stays only in her miseries of the past and is not ready to accept her reality now. Hastily, she takes her book and demands that Stella be aware of the place she is living in. She needs some sunshine and an outing, and for that, she must show her what a great place she lives in now. Is really delighted to give Stella a tour of the mansion, but Stella is not pleased. She already knows the place, probably more than the maid does. She thinks that is just a bore to visit the same place where you have spent half of your entire life in the past. Well, Daisy suggests that they should start with the small exhibition room situated on the second floor of the mansion. Stella knows it's just not right to call that grand, fancy place small. Maybe it is small if seen from the perspective of the wealthy Nacht family, but otherwise, it might be one of the best exhibitions in the continent. The Nacht family protected the land and naturally took up a lot of trade that originated on land. From grains and fruits, to mines, all of these were sources of the Nacht family's endless wealth. Thinking about that, they reached the in-house exhibition, whose theme changes quarterly, as Daisy explains. As soon as they are about to enter the room, they find little Lord Maximus already present there. Daisy greets him, but Stella wonders whether she should also greet Maximus or not. She decides against it, and when Daisy insists that she should also wish the young master, she simply hides behind her. Stella knows it is of no use to make any sort of communication with Maximus. He simply hates weak people, and if he sees her hiding from him, he will simply leave after a while. Stella waits for him to get mad and disappear, but to her surprise, Maximus asks them whether they are heading towards the exhibition room. As soon as Daisy affirms, he immediately tells her to go back first because he will show Stella around himself. No, that's what Stella thinks in her mind. She doesn't want it to happen at any cost. She waits for Daisy to refuse Maximus's proposal, but she gladly accepts it. She even flatters Maximus, telling Stella that he is more qualified than her to become a guide. Daisy leaves them alone together and disappears. Maximus then asks Stella if she is not going to greet him, and she sheepishly does so. He then gives her a piece of advice and tells her not to think about staying in this house for long. Stella could not understand what he meant, but she is now sure that at least Maximus is still the same as before. She accepts his advice and tells him that it was the same thing she was thinking. She tells him that she will soon leave this place of her own accord, and the boy is shocked. Stella has decided not to indulge in any sort of fight with Maximus, and she doesn't have to pretend that she likes being here with him. It was quite similar to what had happened in the past. Maximus used to tell her to get out of this place if she knew that she could not do anything better than being a maid. That time, she could not give him an answer, but now she is sure that she would have liked it if she said that she would do so. Stella tells him not to worry about her, since she knows that being a knack child was too good to be true for an orphan like her, and she would be getting out of this place soon. As soon as she reaches the age of 15, she will apply to the academy and move out of here. She requests him that he should bear her until then. Maximus is obviously frustrated with her answer, and says that he can't believe that she wants to get out of here, to which Stella replies that he was the one who told her to. He somehow gets even more flustered upon hearing that, and says that they will talk about it later. Stella wonders why he is acting so hurt, and she doesn't want to talk about anything later. Anyway, since he is agitated, he is going to leave soon, 
or so Stella believes. However, Maximus asks her to follow him as he is going to show her around the place. Stella gets surprised, as this was not what she expected of him. Maximus explains that since he has promised the head maid to show her around the exhibition, it's his duty to follow his promise. Stella is still confused, as it was easy to say bye and move on their respective paths. She wants to know, doesn't he hate her? Starting with the portraits, Maximus tells Stella about the Nacht family's genealogy and sincerely explains every fact and figure. Stella knows that among the men in this family, Maximus is the least flexible, and it is uncanny to see him like this. Suddenly, something catches Stella's attention, and she turns around to see a brightly shining necklace. She gets a familiar feeling for that object. Maximus notices that her attention has been diverted to something else, and he asks her in a frustrated voice if she is even listening to him. He then looks in the same direction and suddenly says that she has good eyes to find the necklace and asks her if she would like to have a closer look at it. The red crystal embedded in the middle of that necklace was named the Flame of the Heseros, one of the only thirteen named items in the world. Maximus tells her that according to the ancient legacies, only qualified people can wield the named items. Out of the thirteen named items in the world, four belong to the Nacht family, one to Orhin, one to Argo. The necklace is one of them too, and as for the fourth one, Maximus has no idea where it is. He then explains that the flame of Hesaros is special, because it is said that it has never been subjugated by anyone yet. After hearing his description, Stella finally realized why she was having this weird feeling as if she had known it before. She remembers it now clearly. It was her sister, Cynthia, who touched the crystal and got herself into big trouble. Soon after exchanging her powers, Cynthia came to the exhibition and touched Hesaros. Their powerful magics collided, and as a result, Cynthia was knocked out, and Hesaros broke into two. She remained unconscious for two weeks, but then woke up refreshed as if nothing had happened. After that incident, Cynthia became famous as a genius who even a named item could not handle. Also, Heseros disappeared from the Nack Duchy. Stella realizes that maybe the crystal shattered only because Cynthia absorbed her magic. She wonders if she, who originally possesses that power, touches it, would something similar happen. As she reaches out her hand to touch the stone, Stella thinks that maybe she will die. However, as Maximus asks if she is going to touch it, she suddenly stops. Stella apologizes for her mindless act, but Maximus tells her that she can touch it because it won't make any difference. However, she declines the offer, and decides that maybe she will try it someday later. Maximus then decides to tell her further about the details of that exhibition, but Stella is already fed up with his lectures. Stella starts yawning, and he notices it. He retorts at her boredom and gives up, stomping away angrily from the room. Stella sighs and then sits down to rest. She wonders if she should apologize to him. Well, she simply doesn't care enough to do that. They had no connection to each other in the past life, and they are not meant to be friendly this time either. Daisy arrives at the site soon and learns that Maximus left Stella alone in the exhibition. She asks if she was disappointed, but Stella tells her she is fine. Daisy then tells her that she has to prepare for the evening, as there is a special event happening tonight. She just received the telegram from Orhan that he will be back in time for dinner. The subjugation of monsters ended early, and therefore they would be returning home early. It has been quite a while since the last family dinner, and Argo will also attend it, so Stella also has to hurry up and get ready. Stella gets a bit tense after hearing this, but pretends it's fine in front of the maid. She tries to look for excuses for not attending the dinner, but Daisy sternly tells her that this is not going to happen. This dinner has been directly ordered by Orhan himself, and Argo has been granted permission from the academy to go home overnight as well. The head maid tells Stella that on top of that, a very good thing is waiting for her at the dinner. Daisy seems to be so much more excited for this dinner than Stella herself, and the girl has no choice but to follow her commands. That territory of the Nacht family was sometimes called the Underworld, and one of the biggest reasons behind it was the unusual nights here. When Stella came to the castle in her past life, she used to get afraid of this creepy atmosphere and cry until she fell asleep. Now, the door opens, and Stella sees Orhan and his two sons sitting around the grand dining table, waiting for her. It is dark all around, and the room is lit only with candles. Daisy is also holding a candle in her hands to show Stella the way. Orhan asks her to take her seat, and Stella obeys. They have all dressed very formally, looking dashing in their uniform. Stella, on the other hand, was in the best orphanage clothes she could find. It was a black dress giving her a look more like a goth child, with her beautiful brown hair neatly tucked into a half bun. It made her feel a bit uncomfortable, as she was looking quite underclass in front of them. 
This situation is killing her spirit to join the dinner, and even though they are doing nothing, the knacked men are making her uncomfortable by simply existing. Suddenly, Stella notices pomegranates on a plate. Pomegranates were not common as table decorations or as dinner items, but since the Nacked family crest contains pomegranates, they might have it. The Grand Duke then rings the bell, and the family dinner ceremony starts. Dinner is served, and everybody starts eating, except for Stella. It starts raining heavily outside, and Argo talks about subjugation with his dad. Demons tend to get violent when the weather is bad, so it was a good thing that Orhan finished them earlier. On the other hand, Stella is engrossed in her own thoughts. Sitting with three out of the four people she hates the most in the world are on the same dinner table as her. It would be a relief for her if, after this, her stomach didn't get upset. Stella was playing with the tomatoes placed beside the juicy steak on her plate when Argo's voice startled her. He noticed that she was not eating her dinner properly and asked her whether the food was to her liking or not. Stella apologizes for it, but Argo gets worried since he doesn't want to make her feel like that. Orhan joins the conversation and tells her that she doesn't have to apologize for anything she doesn't like. If she doesn't like it, she can leave it on her plate. Stella feels like a baby in front of them who doesn't want to eat and is being pampered with everything. Orhan calls the butler and asks her if there is anything else she wants to eat. Stella humbly refuses the offer, and the Duke gets frustrated at her gesture. He realizes that it was hasty to ask Stella to come to dine with them so soon. The Grand Duke then calls Daisy and tells Stella she can tell her if she needs to eat anything later. The maid then arrives with a plate on which pomegranates were kept. She places it in front of the Grand Duke, and he tears the pomegranate into two pieces. His hands are covered with the juice of the crushed pomegranate that is so thick and red that it looks like actual blood. One piece of that divided pomegranate is placed on a plate that the butler puts in front of Stella. She can't understand what is happening here. The Grand Duke shared that pomegranate he had directly torn with her. What does it mean? The butler congratulates Stella. He tells her that there is a custom in Nacht where, on the arrival of a new member in the family, he or she is welcomed by sharing pomegranates that the head of the family splits himself. It means to enjoy as many blessings as the seeds in the pomegranate. Stella wonders if this is the good news that Daisy was talking about. She then notices her plate and finds that it doesn't look like a pomegranate but like bleeding flesh. Instead of sharing a fruit, it seems as if a wolf pack is sharing the prey their alpha has hunted. Stella thinks it is a barbaric ritual. She had never heard or experienced anything like this when she was with Cynthia. Orhan then tells her to take a bite. Everybody has already started to eat their share of the pomegranate, and Stella picks up a piece and eats it. As she chews it, she can feel all the gazes towards her that make her feel sick. She gets goosebumps as if she was involved with something she should not have. The Grand Duke then announces that, from now on, Stella is officially a child of Nacht. Sitting in her chair, Stella feels alone and lost in gloom. She wonders how an orphan like her can accept herself as a child of Nacht. She tells Orhan that she cannot live up to his expectations, no matter what they are. Upon hearing this, Maximus tries to retort back angrily, but Orhan hushes him. He tells Stella that she is merely a child and should not have been saying this. Indicating towards Daisy, he says somebody has certainly teased her when he was not there. He asks the head maid whether it is true or not, and she gets terrified. She swears that she never said anything like that to the girl and thinks that it might be one of the overzealous maids who don't know how to keep their mouths closed. Daisy claims that since the lady has received a pomegranate now, no one would be able to say anything anymore. The butler assures him that he too will make sure that nobody will be teasing or hurting Stella ever again. Besides, her intelligence has been different from that of her peers, and he is certain that soon, everyone will admire her wisdom and grace. Daisy suggests to the Grand Duke that he should find a suitable tutor for Stella. Stella thinks it is too quick to seek a tutor for her, because in her past life, she started studying three months later. However, Argo also welcomes this suggestion, and Maximus suggests that Stella gets taught alongside him. Stella is surprised because in the past, he was the one who suggested she move out of the place. The Grand Duke tells Stella that she is now the child of the Nacked family now. He doesn't know what nonsense she heard, but she should forget it and never say that she is not worthy of being here. The Grand Duke assures Stella that she should forget whoever told her nasty things about being here. She is now a designated member of the Nacked clan and is important for all. However, Stella is surprised because she cannot forget what happened to her here. She was told that she was good for nothing and her efforts made no difference to anyone. She was even told to go where she came from, 
and that she was hopeless from the beginning. Among these people, she had never experienced anything good at all. She wonders how anybody can get rid of such terrible memories, and even if she does it, can a heart that has already suffered be at ease? Just thinking about it makes her heart ache. The Grand Duke calls her name, while Stella has her hands over her chest because of the pain. She can't breathe, and falls from her seat before faints. She pulls the tablecloth in her dizziness and slips on a pomegranate to fall face first. The Duke rushes to her and holds her. He orders the butler to call a doctor as soon as possible. Orhan tries to comfort Stella and asks her to lean on him until help arrives. Stella leans over him, even though she doesn't want to rely on him or touch him. Yet she faints in his lap. Orhan is worried for her and impatiently asks when the doctor is going to arrive. Stella thinks that the Duke should not pretend as if she is that important to her. She has already faced the worst before. She is feeling suffocated by his unfamiliar kind attitude of everyone around her. Stella thinks that it would be better if instead of being this kind, they all strangle her and kill her. She wants to know what has she done wrong to suffer this much. Why does she have to go through this experience one more time? Her death was the only time she had the freedom to choose in her previous life. She didn't expect even it to turn into something that never happened. The only thing she thought she did of her own will ended up being negated as soon as she returned to this mansion again. Soon after that, everyone goes to Stella's room, where the doctor checks up on her. Orhan asks him why did the girl faint, and he replies that it could be stress as children can easily faint because of stress. Orhan dismisses that as nonsense because his sons have never fainted from stress. Someone tell him that they have the blood of possibly the world's most fearsome man in their veins. The scared doctor answers nervously that since Stella is extremely malnourished, there is a high possibility that she ate oily food which worsened her condition. Argo knows Stella didn't eat that much to make her hurt, and she only just had a bite. The doctor tries to clarify again that maybe it was her first time meeting everyone in such a formal meeting, so she was stressed, and that was the reason she fainted. The butler then suggests that since the girl is sleeping and probably will wake up tomorrow, it would be better that everyone now leave her to rest. He assures the Grand Duke that since he himself and his whole team are there, Orhan doesn't need to worry about anything. The Grand Duke sighs and decides that it is the best possible option for now. It is evident that Argo was not happy to leave her alone here but had no other choice. Stella starts having nightmares in her sleep once again. The voices echo everywhere, with everyone's horrifying gazes fixed on her, calling her a parasite, trash, and even the one who stole Cynthia's power. In her previous life, when Stella was 18 years old, she often cried herself to sleep because she felt guilty of the fact that she stole that magic power from Cynthia. She wanted to wash it away, and did chores the maids were supposed to do. Looking at her worn hands, she thought that her guilt would never get washed away. This pattern was engraved on her body ever since the night she believed that she stole Cynthia's powers. Even crying like this was a luxury for her. Cynthia has given her some advice, so she can't act lazy. She needs to finish making the amulet she had told her to. When Stella was cleaning the mansion as made earlier, Cynthia told her that cleaning was the easiest thing that anybody could do. It was not enough to pay the debt she owed the Nacht family, and she should show even more sincerity than that. Stella asked her what else she could do to pay that debt, and Cynthia suggested she try making an amulet. Amulet is a must of painkiller for wizards. Wizards who use magic of chaos, and sometimes, they can be dominated by that chaos. There have been cases where wizards who got overwhelmed by chaos got turned into demon beasts. An amulet protects the wizards from that, so it is an important item. Stella only wondered if she would be able to make it with her little magical powers. Stella was doubtful of her magical powers, as they were already negligible. But the bigger problem was that she had too little information about making the amulet. She started sewing the amulet in the pattern of the emblem of the Nacht family. Her hands were wounded because of her daily chores. Her fingers were completely covered in bandages, and her palms were bruised. Still, she was sewing the amulet without even knowing if she was doing it right. She had no choice but to keep up with trial and error. The only amulet that could be made with her meager power and poor skills would be a low-level amulet. She was hung up on it for days and days, only to make it right, because she thought it should be helpful at least a little bit. Stella was doing the laundry one day, when one of the maids asked her to clean the room of Lord Argo. Stella had made the amulet for him, and when she gave it to him, he didn't seem to be very interested. She hoped that it would be fine, even if it helped him in some way. However, when cleaning up his room, she found that amulet lying beneath his chair. She was heartbroken to find it in that miserable condition. Argo had already told her, though he knew she worked harder, that it meant nothing to him and her efforts were useless. Stella felt that she should have known that it was wrong to think that this amulet would be of some help to him. 
she was sitting on her knees, holding that amulet, when the maid appeared again to assign her another task. She was still tearfully holding that amulet with a broom in her hand, when Maximus came there to taunt her, saying he was happy to see she was busy with her business. Stella said it is something even she could do, and Maximus replied, saying that nobody has asked her to do it and still she chose to do it anyway. He told her that if she is only as good as a maid, why doesn't she get out of here? Stella could only say that she will pay more attention to it from now on. And then Maximus said that she won't leave this place because she still has vain dreams about his brother. Stella knew that Maximus had misunderstood something. Though it was not a romantic fantasy involving Argo, she had vain dreams about becoming a useful person for her family. She apologized again, and Maximus teased her by saying that she is a shameless woman, and Stella was left teary-eyed. Stella suddenly opens her eyes and gets out of her dream. She was crying and her whole body was covered in sweat. She doesn't know why she had such a dream. She thinks that it is because of the place she was sleeping in. The cradle of the moon always reminds her of Cynthia, and Stella questions herself, how can she be comfortable in this bed? She quietly gets up and tiptoes into the maid room again. The next day arrived, and Maximus knocked at her door, clearly irritated. He sees Stella being treated in the maid's room and not in her moon cradle. He seeks an explanation for this, and Daisy is nervous about how to answer and tell him the truth. She then gathers her courage and says that Stella walked into this room when she was ill last night. Maximus doubts her answer, as he doesn't understand how anybody can leave such a fine mattress and blanket only to find comfort in a maid's bed. He accuses Daisy of just pretending to be nice in front of his father, and she is really not taking care of Stella. The head maid is shocked upon hearing that, but Stella asks Maximus to stop. She tells him that Daisy is telling the truth, and she came to this room by herself. Maximus refuses to believe it, as she might be trying to save the head maid. Stella tells him clearly that she is not that nice to protect someone who has been harsh to her, and Daisy is touched by her words. Maximus is frustrated now, and asks her why she decided to sleep in such a shabby room. Stella wonders why he is so bothered because in her previous life, he had always thought of her as a low person who deserved that. Stella simply tells him that she believed that this treatment was too good for her status. Maximus is too shocked to hear this and tries to emphasize that she is a member of their family now. But Stella thinks that he is naive to expect her to be happy upon hearing the word family. She feels that she has never belonged to them. Daisy then respectfully asks Maximus to leave for a moment, as Stella is still in her night clothes and needs to change. Maximus feels a bit ashamed over hearing this, as he realizes that it was not a very gentlemanly thing to be in a lady's room this early morning, even when she was not ready. Without even looking back, he apologizes and leaves. The doctor also takes his leave, as Stella seems to be completely fine today. Stella notices that she has never seen this doctor before. The previous doctor didn't even pretend to know her. If it were not for the Grand Duke's order, he would not have even cared to examine an orphan. Daisy notices that Stella's expressions have darkened again. She certainly is thinking again. The previous doctor got demoted as he was not able to diagnose her illness properly. After that, the servants working in the mansion spread rumors about not being able to look down on the little lady. Daisy thinks that their discipline was fine enough to make them work even more tightly. She then brings breakfast to Stella so that she can eat before she takes her medicine. She has prepared a warm soup that Stella finishes in one go. Daisy is surprised to see this, and she is moved that her devotion had finally found a place in Stella's heart. Since the girl had been sleeping for two days, to give her something nutritious and sweet, Daisy also brought pudding for her. It is just an apple mashed fine enough to be easy to gulp. Stella is not sure whether she should eat it or not. She thinks that maybe the head maid is too happy to see her finish the whole meal, and that's why she is complimenting it with the apple. Daisy, moving the spoon towards her, asks her to eat it as it is fresh and tasty. Stella is already full, but she still decides to have a spoonful. She feels awkward because she really is not used to being treated this kindly by Daisy or anyone. Daisy then announces that since she has finished her meals, she should get up for something important. Stella wonders what could it be, and gets ready in her winter dress and neatly braided hair. The head maid takes her along and Stella meets a tailor who was called by the Grand Duke himself. The fact that the Grand Duke had called the tailor himself was the only reason Stella is here. She didn't want to come, but Daisy made her get up from her bed, and brought her here even as she kept on saying that she just wanted to sleep. Now, Stella thinks that she still looks like an orphan and not a member of the Grand Duke's family, so it makes sense that she gets some new clothes. However, she is perplexed because she thought that Orhan would go crazy after she ruined the formal family dinner, but he didn't. Stella wonders if he is not the type to mind someone ruining an important dinner, then why did he hate her so much in the previous life? 
She wants to know if it was because she was terribly talentless despite showing initial signs of promise, or was there another reason? Stella was looking at herself in the mirror, busy with her own thoughts, when the tailor pulled her out of it. She tells her that she heard that Lady Stella was very elegant, but she is even more adorable in person. The tailor compliments her beautiful green eyes and noble hair. Pointing towards her skin, she tells her that since she is very white, light colors will go with her skin tone. Daisy also suggests that a specific dark color in pattern would also look good on Stella. They both rejoice and start picking up fabrics together for her, enjoying it more than Stella herself. However, the tailor is quite perplexed because noble kids usually get excited with her compliments, but Stella's expressions are so dry and tasteless. Stella hangs her head on listening to this, and the tailor decides to keep her mouth shut believing that the girl is very sensitive. Stella finds her skin too pale, and her green eyes appear gloomy to her. Her long brown hair is just tasteless and unappealing. She thinks that no matter what kind of clothes she wears, she will just be a funny imitation, unlike Cynthia who suits this position well. Stella thinks that lately, there have been many strange things happening around her. She doesn't want to get swept up in all this and just wants to go back to the shabby life of her orphanage. That's all for this video. With so many uncertain changes happening in Stella's life, how will she adapt to her new reality? And what will happen when her cunning sister finally comes in her life? Stick around to see it later and leave a lot of likes and comments on this video if you liked it. Also, subscribe to our channel and check out more of our videos.